hear a phone ringing. <laughs> Good morning. Well, welcome to all who come to worship with us this morning. Whether you are a regular at Wyandotte First or whether you are um, here on for the first time or whether you're watching us online, we hope your time with us will be enhancing and fulfilling. My name is David Oakes, and I'm the lay leader here at Wyandotte First. Gabriel Royo and I are filling in for Reverend Miller, who is taking a uh, little time off for R&R. &R. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we worship here today, let the music and words of the songs, the words of the prayers, and the words of the message open our hearts and minds to your purpose. Let them guide and direct our pathways throughout the rest of our life, that we may be a servant and a disciple who makes disciples, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and join our vices, voices with the um, praise band.
statement for the month of September is peace. Now, most of you will not recognize that, but this is a program that we've had for many, many years, both here in Wyandotte First and in our former congregations. This is the pastor's emergency fund. Actually, peace stands for Pastor's Emergency Assistant Charity Effort. I just think of it as the Pastor's Fund. We haven't had one for the last couple of years. We want to start to give support to work that the pastor does day in, day out. Many in our community are having a tough time meeting their financial needs. There are many reasons for this, including high grass prices, high grocery prices, and inflation. What many deserve, uh, there are many reasons for this, which when they are really desperate, they ring the bell 
on a church, maybe more than one church, because each congregation treats the subject a little different. The pastor can give spiritual, emotional support, information, but unless he has a couple of bucks, like five for bus fare to Detroit, we've got hungry people and needy people that we have to turn away. So in the month of September, let us consider giving a couple of dollars to the pastor's emergency fund and pray that you will never have to be the one standing outside a church ringing the doorbell. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Good morning, church. Once again, uh, we're going to continue with other opportunities for the week. Uh, our next that we'd like to talk about uh, is the Sakatumi uh, collection uh, sponsored by the NOAA, and that uh, will continue through the month of September. There is a box in the Narthex that you can uh, add your contributions of socks and or underwear to that effort. Uh, and should you uh, want additional information on that, please feel free to contact Julie Taylor uh, in that matter. Our next is we're uh, going to sponsor within the church here an activity called the CRESS, or Civilian Response to Active Shooting Events. It's presented by Wyandotte's Police Department. It'll happen here September 8th uh, between 5 and 7.30 in the Fellowship Hall, I believe. This is, I should mention, a program to talk, talk about um, increasing dangers that we have in our world, unfortunately, but it's guided toward adults, uh, so please uh, uh, do not bring uh, children uh, aged uh, persons with you. Uh, next is September 11th. Oh, let's go with NOAA. We'll continue with NOVA. Also next Sunday, at 8.30, the NOAA Lunch Project will assemble to put together, as you see, 400 lunch boxes or bags for uh, distribution. Uh, NOAA is, of course, the um, reach out for uh, national outreach for uh, assistance to homeless people here in the Detroit area. Um, that'll happen, as I say, uh, next Sunday at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, Thank you. The next Sunday, September 11th, will be our communion service. We will go to a two dual service format. Next Sunday, there will be a communion in either service uh, that you choose to attend. There will be also sacrament packs available outside the church starting uh, the 6th at noon o'clock. We'll have those in the box for your pickup if you're unable to make it Sunday. And you, for those at home, you can come pick up and uh, participate well uh, online. Um, uh, just a quick note as we rush to uh, talk our opportunities, there is in the back a brief reminder of everything you might have missed or you, you didn't quite catch. In the back, please feel free to grab one of those and stay with it. Okay, excuse me. Sorry to interrupt, folks. I'm looking for someone who can uh, give me some facts. The chief sent me over here with some questions. I'm Detective Joe Sunday, and I'm here looking for the facts. Hey, Joey, I think I can help you out a little bit. 
Uh, and you're uh, Dave Wagoner here. Yes, I'm the music director here. Music yes. director. Yes. Good person to answer these questions. What can you tell me about the two different church services starting next week? Now, mind you, just the facts. Just the facts. Just the facts, Joe. Well, let's see. Next Sunday, we start with two services. So 930 will be the Oasis service kind of like the service we have now. It's a modern contemporary service with the praise band. Uh, and at 11.30 will be the heritage service, which is a more traditional service, and you'll find the organ with hymns and the choirs. Uh, so if you're looking for a more traditional service, you would come to the, uh, to the heritage service. Interesting. Okay, if the Oasis is at 9.30 and the heritage is at 11.30, uh, what's gonna happen in between? Oh, in between, we have a Sunday school for the kids, we have a Bible study for adults, and then we have the all-important, don't want to miss this, coffee and donuts. Ah, donuts. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, listen, that's wonderful. Thanks for all the information. Just one more question and just the facts now. Okay. Where can I get those donuts you mentioned? I'm starved. Ah, well, after the service in the fellowship hall, coffee and donuts just for you, and that's a fact. So I just have to wait. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Joe Sunday. I wish they would have let me finish so I wouldn't have to follow that. <laughs> anyway. All right. Please join me in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come in your presence with eyes closed and hearts open, asking to be renewed of spirit by your glory. We give thanks for the opportunity to join together as a family, despite our many different backgrounds and situations. In a world filled with chaos and despair, we thank you, Lord, for this Oasis First Church as a place of peace and fellowship. We thank you for everyone, from our pastor to our staff, to the volunteers who work and serve in your name during this time of worship with their gifts of song, music, technical proficiency, or teaching. We raise our thanks to you, Lord, this weekend, just as our nation does this time, to give pause and remember those who labor daily and have labored before us to pave this path that has led us all here today. We are thankful for the handful of believers who gathered here in Wyandotte over 167 years ago and planted and cultivated seeds of faith that have now blossomed into the First United Methodist Church of Wyandotte. Those seeds with roots so deep that we are yet able to enjoy the fruits of their labor. We take time to express our gratitude and pray for the individuals who labor worldwide, whether they be soldiers acting as the vanguard of peace on foreign lands, law enforcement personnel here on domestic soil, first responders everywhere, teachers in our community, and our government officials who we entrust with the oversight of our infrastructure. But today, we also take a moment to raise each person who toils within an office or an assembly line or in a factory, the welders, the carpenters, the electricians, and the farmers in their field. We lift those who labor without wage within their own homes and whose only payment is the satisfaction as they struggle to parent and provide a Christian environment for their families in whatever manner they must. Lord, we humbly approach your throne and we ask all this in the name of the Father, our Creator, the Son, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit, our inspiration, as we close using the words he has given us as an example. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, look upon my need. I need you. I need you. Have mercy now on me, forgive me, oh Lord, forgive me, and 
scripture today is from Ephesians 3, verses 16 to 17. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you're being rooted and established in love. <clears throat> Before the term megachurch was ever conceived, Charles H. Spurgeon pioneered one th right in the heart of London, England. When he was just 21 years of age, the New Park Street Church in London called him to be their pastor. God began to move in the midst of the church, and soon people were coming in very, such large numbers that the church building would no longer hold them. So they constructed a new building the Metropolitan Taber Tabernacle, which seated 6,000 people, which was in Harvard in that day, and they filled it twice every Sunday. For 31 years, he filled Metropolitan Tabernacle twice on Sunday, and hundreds and hundreds of people came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ each year and were baptized. Charles Spurgeon, who was referred to by many as the Prince of Preachers, would have been the first to tell you that the source of the church's strength and success wasn't in any special program or new ideas, nor was it in the words that he preached. Left themselves, they were just mere words. There was a greater source of strength. So what was it that gave this church its power? This morning, we continue in this series of Rooted. I want to take a look at the prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesians church. 
Paul was the founding pastor of this church, and he loved the church and earnestly prayed for it. By looking at this example, my prayer is that we will see what we need to, to be praying for, and that what we move to our knees as Paul was, and to plead on behalf of this congregation to our Father in heaven. So what was it that Paul prayed for this church? Now the first thing Paul prays for is the strength of the church. In Ephesians 3, we find that for this season, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of the glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through the spirit of your inner being. Now notice first that all of the focus on Paul's prayer was in the inner being. What exactly is the inner being? Every person here is a compound being. We are composed of body, a mind, and a spirit. The body is your physical nature or your outer appearance. The mind is your thinking, your intelligence, your personality. And your spirit is the part of you that is eternal, that part of you that was created in the image of God. And it is what makes man unique from all other creations. Plants have a body, and that's it. They have no mind nor spirit. You never see a plant sink into deep depression. Animals have a body and a mind, yet they don't have a spirit. Animals have emotions. A dog can have a personality, but they have no concern over spiritual issues. You never see a group of chickens in a chicken house saying, why am I here? A chicken crossed the road and saw a KFC and said, I know why we're here, and it's not good. Mankind instinctively knows that there is more to life than this because we have the inner being, the spirit within us, that longs for a relationship with our creator. And it's that spirit who truly defines who we are. If we were to remove my legs and arms, who I am would not change. If my attitude changed, it wouldn't change the fact that I'm still David Oakes. My spirit is who I am, and that spirit is what endures forever. This tent of a body is only a temporary setting and will soon be gone. But my spirit will last forever. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Through outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. This shell of a body is falling apart, yet my spirit is being renewed every day by the power of God. Now, if this was the case, if the outer being was temporary and the inner being eternal, why is it that we tend to focus so much on the outer being rather than on the inner being? Which is more important? We tend to be more concerned with our outer appearance than we are about how well-being of our spirit. Don't believe me. Let me ask you this. Which do you spend more time in the morning getting ready for church, your outer appearance or your inner spirit? But we tend to focus more on our outer shell, and this is also evident by the focus of our prayers. We pray for the physical needs of others, yet we tend to neglect to mention our spiritual needs. I have a little cartoon that I placed in the bulletin board that shows a preacher writing on a chalkboard all the prayers, requests that two old women in the church. And finally he says, does anyone have a non-biological prayer to request? Think about your own prayers. How often we pray for a person's kidney, their heart, their spleen, but how often do we pray about their soul? And how much more important is the well-being of a person's soul than the well-being 
of their spleen. It is the inner being that we should be the primary focus. Now, it's not wrong to be concerned about the physical being. In fact, you're supposed to be. But realize that God's focus is on that which will last forever. And it is that spirit within you that will determine how well you truly are. 1 Peter 3, verses 3 to 4 says, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be your inner self, the unfading beauty of the gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth to God's sight. So let me ask you, how is it with your soul this morning? Is your outer shell was removed, what would be revealed? Now Paul prayed for what that inner being, the spirit would be strengthened. Why was this necessary? It's necessary because it's the only way we will ever truly be all that God wants us to be. Our spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, and there is a struggle between the two. That's why I think so many enjoyed watching The Incredible Hulk, because we have a beast within us that just wants to go in all directions. There is a battle going on within every one of us, the battle between the spirit living within us and the fallen nature inherited from Adam. Paul knew of his struggle, and when he wrote in Romans 7.21, So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For the inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner in the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We all relate to that. We know that <coughs> Excuse me. We know what we want to do, but the temptations are so strong. The temptation is there, but God has promised always to provide a way out. And where that strength is needed is to take that escape route. We need the strength to resist our sinful nature, and that strength is provided to us, not by our own power, but by allowing the Holy Spirit to con greater control of our lives. Now what happens as a result of this strength? Jesus Christ comes to live in his our hearts. John 14, 23 says, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. I like how the Message Bible uh, puts this verse. It says, because of a loveless world, said Jesus, it is a sightless world. If anyone loves me, he will carefully keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we'll move right into the neighborhood. That is what is meant by Ephesians 3.17, that Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith. The verb dwell literally means to settle down and feel at home. Certainly Christ has already resided in the hearts of Ephesians, or else Paul would not have addressed them as saints in Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. What Paul is praying for is a deeper experience between Christ and his people. He yearns for Christ to settle down and to feel at home in their hearts, not a surface relationship, but an ever deeping, deepening fellowship. Christ wants not only to come into your house, he wants to come and feel comfortable being there. When I was just out of college, Sandy and I were invited over to dinner at an apartment of a few guys I worked with. These were three bachelors who were not Christians. When we walked in, the first thing that popped out at us, besides the milk crates, was the calendar on their fridge. It had at least a dozen pictures of, well, let's just say a portion of the women's upper torso that should, not remain, that should remain covered up. 
but wasn't. Now that made me feel uncomfortable, but imagine my wife. So I went to my friend and said, hey Coop, would you mind taking down that calendar? It's not proper, especially when a woman's present. And then I said, as if he wanted us to stay, it would have to come down. You see, a person can be invited into a house and not feel comfortable there because what is there? Now how about the house in your heart today? Is Christ comfortable with what is there? Is there any area of your life that you haven't turned over to him and allowed him to change to fit his needs? Perhaps it is your language, your habits, your checkbook, your attitude. How about the truly saying in the morning, Christ, make yourself at home in my life today. Now the next thing Paul prayed for was for the church to be able to grasp the extent of God's love for them. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19 says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Now notice first that the church is to be rooted and established in love. Love should be the one thing that the church does best. Yet it seems that the church can be the most hateful place on earth. Even in our preaching, we can portray an image of a hateful God who is against everything and hates everything and everybody. There is a story about an overzealous preacher who sat on the local bus local bus condemning the sinners of that city. He carried an oversized Bible to condemn those in, to hell who had deemed were sinners. When a drunk got on the bus, the preacher went to work. You lousy drunk, did you not know that you're going straight to hell? The drunk stopped, looked at his ticket and said, did I get on the wrong bus again? The point is this, we need to be rooted in love and sharing that love with the lost world. God is love and we need to speak the truth in love. The church is to be a place overflowing with love that God has lavishly pouring on us. That love is greater than anything we can comprehend. Paul prayed that we may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, <clears throat> excuse me. That early church bishop, Jerome, understood this passage to say that the love of Christ reaches up to include holy angels, that it reaches down to include even the evil in hell, that it is length covers the men who are striving on the upward way, and its breadth it covers the men who are wandering away from Christ. What kind of love is this that God has for you? First, know it is far-reaching love, for God so loved the world. How big is the world? Are you in the world? That means that you are included in his love. And it doesn't matter who you are and what, what you've done, because God's love is an unconditional love. It's not earned by being good and not changed by being bad. God loves you, and there is nothing he can do to prevent that. God loves you not for what you've done, but for who you are. A while back, my oldest girl, Mary, had broke a major rule in our house and was disciplined for doing so. That night, when she was going to bed, she asked me, Dad, are you still mad at me? I told her no, but I was disappointed in what she did. Then she said, Dad, do you still love me? I said, of course, and then explained that no matter what she did, it would never change the fact that I loved her. Nothing in the world would separate her from that love I have for her. 
God loves you with a far-reaching love, an un unconditional love, and also a self-sacrificing love. No greater love as a man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God's love for you is not a cheap love. It's a love that cost him everything. When you're dead with your sins, separated from God by your sins, Jesus took your sins and went to the cross. Many years ago, a college cheerleader was killed in a tragic accident. She was a beautiful young girl with her whole life in front of her and was engaged to be married to the man who truly loved her. While driving home with her fiance, she lost control of the car and was killed instantly while her fiancé in the seat next to her was left practically unharmed. Prior to the funeral, the pastor asked the young man if he would be willing to say a few words. He said it would be difficult, but he agreed. At the funeral, the young man was understandably upset, but in his talk, one thing was said that touched everyone who gathered. He looked at the casket of his deceased fiance and said, Stacy, if God would have allowed me, I would have taken your place that day without a single question asked. Do you realize that the love of God has for you? He didn't ask how much you had sinned or will you be faithful to me till the end? No, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly without single question asked. That's the amazing love that God has for you. And now, how will you respond to it? I don't know if it's still there or not, but you are as you are crossing the Mississippi River along I-10 in Louisiana, there used to be a large billboard which caught your eye. It stood high above all else, just as you start up the Mississippi River Bridge. And on it is a picture of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross of Calvary with his head bowed. The caption underneath it simply read, it's your move. God loved you so much. Jesus died on the cross for you. Now it's your move. How will you respond? Amen. So please rise for our final song, The Solid Rock.
Jesus, we lift your name in praise and claim it as our solid rock on which we build our lives, our church, our world around us. May your spirit continue to renew us the remainder of the day and throughout the week. Lord, I thank you for First Church and pray you grant all your mercies upon your people that you have led here. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. And all the people said, Amen. Thank you.